So there are two enforcement mechanisms under the anti-spam legislation. One is regulatory or agency enforcement. There are three agencies responsible for the enforcement. I'll go into more detail on each. They, in two cases, they can impose administrative monetary penalties. The penalties are designed to ensure compliance with the legislation and not to penalize those who contravene the legislation. And alongside the regulatory enforcement is a private right of action. Now we got the idea for the private right of action based on can spam, but we opened it up beyond ISPs to any person, be they an individual or a business entity, and it's also available for class action suits. So who are the three enforcement agencies responsible? The CRTC, the Canadian Radio, Television, and Telecommunications Commission, is the enforcement agency responsible for enforcing the anti-spam clause, the unauthorized alteration of transmission data clause, and the unauthorized installation of computer software clause. The Competition Bureau, pursuant to the amendments to the Competition Act and the legislation, will enforce the provisions regarding false and misleading representations in electronic messages or online. They already have an AMPS regime built into theirs that is not dissimilar from what the CRTC has in their legislation. We'll go into the monetary amounts shortly. And lastly, the Office of the Privacy Commissioner of Canada is responsible for enforcing the collection of electronic addresses without consent, i.e. address harvesting and dictionary attacks, and the unauthorized collection of personal information via access to computer systems that are done in contravention of an act of parliament. The PRA is available to contraventions of Pepita in Castle. However, she does not currently have monetary penalties available to her. So the Privacy Commissioner cannot impose penalties. This is a new role for the CRTC. Uh, the CRTC in Canada regulates telecommunications and broadcasting sectors. This was uh, an extension of the roles in that area, taking advantage of the existing expertise they had within the CRTC regarding telecommunications. They already had an enforcement mandate under the Do Not Call legislation of which the first significant penalties were imposed this past December. And they will not only investigate violations, but they adjudicate in the first instance. That means if you receive a notice of violation and there's a hearing, the hearing is in front of CRTC commissioners, and they will make a decision based on the facts of the case if you're going to appeal, you appeal to the federal court in Canada. The Competition Bureau, in contrast, serves notice of violation, does the investigation, but the Competition Tribunal, a separate tribunal, enforces. For the Office of the Privacy Commissioner, they investigate and adjudicate, but as I mentioned earlier, they have no monetary penalties available to them, so you'll be receiving a, a letter saying, please stop what you're doing. The CRTC has new investigatory powers. They can make preservation requests on TSPs. They can file production orders. And they have search warrant provisions to enter onto the premises. So what are the AMPs? AMPs regimes exist under a number of Canadian regulatory regimes. The purpose, as I've stated, is to ensure compliance and deter violations and not uh, penalize those who contravene the legislation. They apply to the first four violations 
I mentioned earlier. The CRTC, as I just mentioned, will adjudicate and can impose monetary penalties without a requirement to go to court. Under the AMPS regime, each and every commercial electronic message can carry a maximum penalty of a million dollars for individuals and $10 million in the case of any other, per, uh, any other person, that being corporations, commercial entities, partnerships, organizations, etc. There is a significant degree of flexibility. So the AMP can start at $0 and make its way up to a million or make its way up to $10 million. The CRTC has the flexibility to suspend AMPs. I can impose a $2 million AMP on a commercial entity and say for the next three years, as long as you are compliant with the legislation, this AMP will not be enforced. And at the end of that three year period, if you are compliant, we can waive the monetary penalty. So this was designed again for legitimate enterprises who contravene the act. We can provide an instant monetary penalty if you've done so for malicious purposes. But if you're a legitimate enterprise who makes a mistake, we can hit you with an AMP and suspend the AMP for a period under which you continue to be compliant. Under section 20, when assessing the monetary penalties, the CRTC, as well as a judge in a private right of action, must take in a number of factors to be considered. Size and scope of the violation is one. A person's history with respect to any previous violations is two. And any, basically any factor that is brought forward during the case must be taken into consideration when imposing the monetary penalty, including the person or the entity's ability to pay the, pe the penalty. Other remedies that are available, they can impose injunctions, restraining orders, cease and desist orders. Enterprises can enter into an undertaking, a compliance agreement with the CRTC, the Competition Bureau, or the OPC to say, in this undertaking, we agree that we violated the legislation, we will not do so again. And this is what I'm talking about, where if you enter into a compliance arrangement, they can, over time, waive, suspend or waive the penalties. And there are offenses built into the legislation. Most of these are with regards to obstruction of justice, interfering with an investigation, or providing false information. Uh, extending, extended liability. The regime itself was designed to be a follow the money regime. We're not following the technology. We're not going to go after people whose computers were infected by a bot and they were sending out spam. As such, we have an extended liability regime. If an entity like the NFL hires a marketing wholesaler, who hires a marketing distributor, who hires an internet marketer, who hires an email marketer, who hires a spammer. Everybody in that chain can be held liable for the violations of the spammer. You must ensure due diligence and put in your contracts and be clear that the people I'm hiring to take out and do the marketing campaign will not contravene the law of the land. Directors and officers can be held liable for the actions of their employees. Just because the CEO doesn't know the marketing department is spamming people doesn't get the CEO off the hook. And something else, this gets at the forward to a friend situation 
you cannot aid, induce, procure, or cause to be procured the contravention. This is important. I can't induce people to send spam. I can't say forward this to all your friends if they don't fall under the friends and family relationships definitions. The private right of action is available to any person in Canada. It is good for all six violations under the legislation. They provide remedies for actual damages. Somebody installed something on my computer and my computer doesn't work anymore. I'm seeking $3,000 to replace the functionality of my computer. And statutory damages, I couldn't work for a month because my computer went kaput. I lost $100,000. Beyond that, there is a regime within the legislation that lays out for each commercial electronic message in violation, the cap is $200 to a maximum of a million dollars per day. However, for contraventions of Section 7 or Section 8, there is no $200 limitation. As I mentioned earlier, class action suits are available and the three enforcement agencies have the right to intervene in private actions. That said, there's a marked difference between the judicial process in Canada and the process in the United States regarding private rights of action. In Canada, if you bring a frivolous case forward, the loser pays. I'm on the hook for the defense legal fees. I could even be found to be wasting the court's time and be on the hook for some of the court fees. So frivolous, we're not concerned that, and the tort system in Canada is quite different from the United States, but we're not concerned that the courts are going to get bogged down by thousands upon thousands of private rights of action for fear of the loser paying. You want to take down RIM, you want to take down Microsoft, you bring them to court, it takes two years, they've got 30 lawyers working on the file, do the math, loser can be on the hook for half a million up to a million dollars, easily. What are the protections for enterprises that would make an honest mistake? One, if you're sending spam, people will complain to you. Don't send this to me anymore. If you get enough of them, you've probably contravened the legislation. First course of action is stop doing whatever it is you were doing. Second course of action is you can enter into an undertaking or compliance agreement with one of the three enforcement agencies at any time prior to adjudication. Entering into an undertaking also restricts the statutory damages to a private right of action. So I enter into a compliance agreement with the CRTC. They hold a million dollar penalty over my head. I can't have a class action suit brought against me for the same violations regarding the statutory damages. I can always have the actual damages pursued in private rights of action. Barring entering into an undertaking or compliance agreement with one of the three enforcement agencies, you end up in a hearing or a proceeding. There's a due diligence defense. We had the policies and processes in place so that we would not contravene the legislation. A technical glitch occurred. It is not the company's uh, fault for uh, the action that took place. The software vendor had a glitch in their software, et cetera. I can show that I was due diligent and did not intend to contravene the legislation. 
And barring having a due diligence defense, the final safeguard are the factors to be considered for section 20. Did I profit from the violation? Can I pay the penalty? What was the size and scope of the violation? Did I damage or cause damage to be incurred by individuals or businesses? And any other relevant factor that is heard during the proceedings must be taken into account by those who are adjudicating and setting the penalties. If you are the, uh, on the wrong end of a CRTC decision and you want to appeal the decision, you must do so to the federal court. If you want the CRTC to review a preservation or a production order saying, I cannot preserve that data or I cannot produce that data in the time frame that you wanted me to be able to do it, it's too costly on the enterprise, you have to appeal to the CRTC to review their preservation or production orders. Domestic and international cooperation. Within the legislation, we built in mechanisms to allow the three enforcement agencies to share information, intelligence, and evidence. They can also share with international counterparts in other jurisdictions. We have more time for questions now. 